Okay, hello everybody. This is session number five of the Fountainhead Reading Group, sponsored by the Atlas Society. And as I normally do, I'm going to have to read this off the screen. I want to read the, the kickoff question I wrote to sort of focus the initial discussion. Oh, and here it is, very short. Near the end of chapter 15, Rourke asked Mike, the construction worker, to help him find a manual labor job that would not require him to think. When Mike offers to loan Rourke money instead, Rourke replies, quote, I'll tell you what I told, I told Austin Heller. If you ever offer me money again, that'll be the end of between us. The question is, why did Rourke respond so curtly to Mike's offer to help him financially? You know, this again was written not like I know the answer and I'm going to enlighten you all because I found this puzzling. I noticed somebody on the uh, found the, the reading group website replied something to the effect that because well, work was had integrity and wanted to be independent. And yet it explicitly states, the text does, that work was asking a favor even greater than a loan of money by asking him to help him find a, a manual job. So clearly work was not opposed to offering asking friends for favors. And I'm wondering, so what is the difference between the favor he did ask and the offer of money? What was so unique or, I don't know, about money that would make it something he would refuse, and not just refuse, but curtly refuse, to the point of, of saying he'd cut off a friendship if, if he was asked again, unless he just meant that in a not serious way. So, anyone have thoughts on this? Um, I would say that having a job, he would be working and making his own money. He would have earned it as if Mike just gave it to him. He didn't earn anything. Well, he, he would repay it though. I mean, that's the nature of a loan. Um, but you could say, maybe, you, I suppose you could also say he didn't earn the help of uh, Mike to find him work either. I don't know. Um, I mean, is it sort of a symbolic thing with work, or is it? I mean, clearly, I don't think Rand considered this a fault in work, that he refused offers of loans. She considered, uh, I guess, admirable, admirable or what. But I know she, in her personal life, loaned money to people. So. Well, there's an interesting thing with... Hey, Patrick. There's an interesting thing with work's profession as an architect is if he doesn't have clients, he can, he can design things out of his imagination, but it's not, it's not like a painter or a sculptor or a writer. He actually needs clients to build, to, to, to be, a functioning architect, he needs clients. He can't right. do anything without them. So someone giving him money doesn't give him clients. So it's kind of like a mute point. What's the purpose of money if I don't have a client? Well, to stay but, alive. But he's to not pay. necessarily uh, yeah. looking for clients because he's willing to- Well, I'm saying you could give money to a painter like me and that creates paintings. So it's a slightly yeah. different. And we lost Nicole. Nicole, you said something, but your voice was garbled and I couldn't make it out. Can you repeat it? Maybe she's going to click uh, back in. Michael, I just was listening to your point and I find the discussion of clients and Rook's approach in the book interesting. Um, I think that with a lot of companies, regardless of an artistic individual or not, um, there are customers that are kind of bad eggs and you want to avoid them in some cases they can cause you a lot of problems um, and uh, they can drain you of resources um, that you might want to better allocate to your good customers who um, for example uh, you know most companies would have a uh, certain amount of uh, receivables that might be overdue and some business uh, people are perpetually slow to pay their, um, you know, their invoices to other companies. And those are the sorts of long-term arrangements that can create a lot of drag. Um, and for me, uh, I was sort of reading some of the client 
um, value system of Rourke, and it's like he's got this inbuilt uh, detector. You know, where he's like, I don't want to work with this person, and in fact, I'm better off not working with them. Um, and I see some of that in that character, and I like that. So, um, I think the friendship thing with Mike, though, is just a maybe pride and not wanting money to complicate the friendship and wanting to make it on his own, not wanting to have you know, beg them, borrow them. He wants to be good enough to make it on his own. It's interesting in, in the three, I think in, in this material we read, the chapters, what, 13, 14, the, there are three people that offer him money. Uh, one of them is Keating, which he refuses, or endorses the check and gives it back to him. He signs the check over to Keating and gives it back to him. The other two are friends of his who legitimately admire him. And I'm sure they meant the offer of financial help in a benevolent way. Like, I believe in what you're doing. It would be tough to get going, and I want to help you. In that sense, I suppose you could consider that kind of curvy. It's not, again, just to refuse or no thanks. I'd rather do it on my own. It's that kind of, you know, if you say that again, that friendship over. Um, that strikes me as kind of insensitive, to say the least. Uh, that's um, Grant's character. I, when I read that, given the money there's a uh, it's not earned money it's not an equal trade yeah it could be paid back later but in the meantime he's obligated to mike or to the other friends if he had accepted it and nothing future promissory in return whereas with a job once he gets a building he and mike work together mike works on a building he designs them and you know in that sense there's a trade back and forth of uh, an equal nature right but with the money there's not it's a one-way thing and Rourke does not want to be obligated to anybody in that manner that he can't equally offer something in return at that time it's unearned so you think a loan like that would put the person kind of in a dependency like I have an idea that's not philosophical but that's a plot device. Allow that once. We only, only get one shot. Once, I know. But it occurred to me, if he gets money, then he doesn't have go. He <laughs> How do we get him into the quarry? That's <laughs> true. <laughs> it's true. He has to get to Connecticut. Otherwise, he would stay there, and he would, um, you know, maybe wait around some more. But this way he gets a job, he gets to the quarry, he meets Dominique, right? Right. But nonetheless, the quarry somehow. nonetheless, Rand did nothing just because. Everything she does has a reason. Important and, to get and perhaps multiple reasons. Listen, people, I've got to get my landlord over here to piss a busted toilet. He just called me. I'm going to excuse myself for like one minute, call him back. I don't. I want him to know when he's coming over to fix that thing. So, <laughs> right back. Um, I, Marilyn, I like your point. I think maybe it's a plot device. Uh, I also think that money, in particular, for Rand was uh, one of her special topics. You know, um, it's yeah, that's true. That she attached a lot of philosophical import on. Um, you know, it was a very concrete objective value structure around money. Um, and what I find uh, well, not particularly interesting, but just in her books, there are a lot of characters who seem to uh, have this almost superhuman perception of one another. Like someone does something and they, they know all the nuances that are built into that. Um, real life often requires a lot more explanation and guessing other people's is, right, but uh, it's a bit easier when you write characters. Marilyn, I was distracted by the point. Could you repeat your non-philosophical point? Summarize oh. it. it Seem to get a good reaction. I said that um, it, it was it's a plot device also because with if um, someone just gives if Mike I guess or Austin just gives uh, Rourke money, he might stay where he is. 
but he, the job that he gets is the way he gets to Connecticut and gets to the quarry, and this is how we get the um, meeting between him and, and Dominique. And Mike, you replied that Rand always had a point in these things, and that probably wasn't the only reason. Did I understand that correctly? Right. Mike, okay. Mike, Mike, Mike talked about that she's not oh. going to just do things only for the plot. She's going to do things because it, it's something about the character. I think she just tried to trash Rourke as badly as possible, either from outside sources or from his own stubbornness. Stuff. Yeah. That well, she, she, she just wanted to just pile on crap against this guy and see how much he could take. Yeah. And it could be from his own, like Dagny begs for money. When she needs it for the John Gold line. So Rand got to the point where, oh, it's okay to ask for money. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an interesting character development there. Yeah. But with but, her, she just wanted to pile it on and But I would and, say that that Domini uh, that, that um Dagny asked for money in exchange for stock in the company or whatever. They weren't just giving her the money, they were investing to get their return later. Right. I, I think well, 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 it's about the higher principle, like borrowing money to save a rail road or to save a company, whereas Rourke's principle is that he wants to be good enough to make it on his own. So accepting the money is actually in a different direction to his highest values. It's his own expression, um, and you know, he wants to build things according to his vision, but not compromise and um, get there by sort of half doing it how he wants to and half doing it how someone that he perceives as having a lesser aesthetic or lesser vision. But I think it's also he has a fierce, um, uh, there's a fierce uh, or sort of individualist um, yeah. you know, fire where he's like, it's about his own uh, work and making it on his own and doing it how he wants to be. It's sort of a, I take Michael's interpretation, we can see that work is sort of a version of, uh, I'm sorry guys, I think my landlord came over. I apologize for this. Uh, I'll go chase him away. <laughs> I'll come back later. What do you oh. think, Marilyn? Um, I like, I, I like that point that you make. I also think it does and I like what you said too about trashing work, just putting in like uh, all this temptation on him. On the other hand, I do like his his um, his approach that I got this. Yeah, I you know I, you don't have to lend me money. I'm not in that bad of shape. I'm not given up. I haven't lost my abilities. Just find me a job. I'll, whatever job it is, I'll take it. Right. So um, I'll, and I I'll, as long as I can keep working and I'm, I can keep. Um, like a shark that has to keep swimming or something, right? Just let me keep working, and rather than let me, then I'll um, something will something will happen. So there's a sense of optimism there too, a sense that of um, real confidence and courage uh, in in the in the um, in in uh, hard times. Um, let me present something in a more personal manner. Has anybody here ever been offered help and turned it down because of pride? I have on occasion, but it hasn't been. I have. I have. Be, I mean, good friends, people willing to help out, and I'm like, uh, no thank you. I'll well, take care of it myself. During my life, though, it hasn't usually been regard to money. I've accepted loans from people, and I've given people loans. Uh, friends of mine, especially when I was making up, I actually loaned a significant amount of money. Uh, the In California, I had a friend I hadn't seen in 10 years. He came to me with a desperate story. I think I loaned him $500. And typically in those situations, I tell people, look, I don't want this to mess up the friendship. So just consider this a gift. There's no payment schedule. If and when you can pay me back, that's fine. But I'm not going to, you know, can't that's fine too i try to look at those as gifts because as somebody else mentioned you can screw up a friendship 
if there's that tension over money. I'll tell you a very brief story. I won't go into the details, but about um, 13 years ago, uh, it's a very bad problem. My wife had a stroke. She was in the hospital, a lot of problems with the family. And I was flat, my in-laws rated a joint bank account. I had no money. It was just awful. And I get a phone, I get an email from a guy I haven't seen since college. And he says, hi, George, I've been trying to, it's just the same George Smith. We communicate, and he said, you probably don't remember, but when you had a stroke of financial luck back in the 70s, uh, I came desperate to you asking for money. I loaned, you loaned me like $5,000. And he said, I want to repay it. So he sends me Federal Express a check for $10,000. And this was like, <laughs> this was like my life was at the lowest point it ever had been. It didn't impress me enough to make me believe in God. But I, was, I thought, boy, you talk, this is literally within a day after I thought, what the hell am I gonna do? And I thought, okay, this is sort of a serendipity. It's, it's sort of a happy coincidence, but it, it was really amazing. But I've never had a problem with that. Uh, but I have had problems with people who offer to help me in other ways, uh, oh, I can find some details, but yeah, that's fine. Anybody else want to reply to this? I, I have a small, significant story next to that, which I think is funny. Um, so uh, I was working with a guy uh, in, in a bar when I was studying, and he run out of cash, and we were cash strapped. It was like work on the weekends, work until four in the morning, get your box tips. And he's like, oh, I really just want, um, you know, can I borrow $50 to go out? And I was like, ooh, I don't know, will you pay me back? And he was like, yeah, 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 I promise, you know, I promise. I'm like, really good with money, I'll pay people back. I was like, all right. So I gave him the money, and in my head, I was like, I'm never going to see this money. But I give it anyway. And then uh, less than a week later, I asked when we got paid, hey, you know, do you have that $50? And he was like, what $50? You know, like he basically <laughs> went in on booze and got drunk and forgot. And I was like, are you serious? It's like not even seven days. Like, so I think you have these full experiences and you have bigger ones over time and you develop your, uh, you know, willingness or non-willingness to lend people cash. Uh, yeah. So, well, I'm sure we've all had experiences like that, but anyway, well, I've, uh, had, I've had, um, well, uh, being a full-time artist, it always goes in waves. You sell a big painting, money comes in, and then you have six months where nothing is coming in, and it goes in waves. I've had people uh, invest in my work. So, like, I've yeah. had collectors say, well, Here's five thousand dollars, and if when you sell one of your major paintings, pay me back. So that becomes kind of an investment, and I've done that with a few people, which um, has worked out pretty well. Um, and um, yeah, so that yeah, was. I, I've had offers that I've refused for money just because the person giving the money wanted to control what what went into the project. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that, <laughs> I remember I, George. I did all these conferences for over 16 years in the 70s and 80s and early 90s. And there was always some, and I was a good speaker. I did American history lectures for Tito and stuff. And there were always some wealthy business people there who wanted to kind of get on my good side during the conference so they could kind of hang out with me. So there were always, I, I swear to God, there was a, a, a year didn't go by. There was some guy. I thought he was rich. I'd like to help you. Is there a project I can help you finance? Finally, one guy who was a wealthy guy from uh, Texas, uh, he asked about what I'd be interested in writing a book on American history from the Revolution up through the Civil War, and I expressed an interest in that because that's what my lectures cover. And I, and I even had a title for it called "From Revolution to Counter Revolution," and. Uh, so he hung out with me and a bit of a loud mouth, but I thought, you know, are you serious about this? By that point, I just asked him straight out. But, oh no, and then we worked out a financial plan. It was a healthy amount of money for, I'd say, taking at least two years. And uh, I think he was gonna pay me five grand a month for two years, for, which in the 80s was even now isn't bad. And uh, basically we did everything but shake hands on it. 
And then he starts saying, you know, I hope you can put in some stuff about gun control in the Second Amendment, because that's really important. And I said, well, it might come up at some point, but it's not a book about gun control. I said, no, and he kept bugging me about it, you know. I said, well, I don't know. I, I was kind of offering my I'd hope you put a lot about gun control. I said, this is a general American history. You know, I can't have a whole chapter on gun control just stuck in there. And finally, I just got fed up and I said, look, this isn't going to work. Um, I, one of my better work-like lines was, um, I said, look, we're walking on the campus of uh, Dartmouth, I remember, in the evening. And he said, well, da 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 And I said, look, uh, the deal is here. You provide the money. I write the book. And I'm a good writer. He said, well, where's your, uh, where's your uh, private plane? Because he owned one. And he, this is sort of a nasty. I make a lot of money. I know what I'm talking about. And I said, quote, it's parked right next to your first book. <laughs> <laughs> and he was he was uh, 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 smart enough to catch that I just insulted him. So that was it. But anyway, I tried to tell my personal stories. But... <laughs> so one of my better comeback lines, I think, because it was uh, just instinctive. I remember as soon as did you know? But that's but that's interesting of the influence of Ayn Rand's characters, like what would work do. What right. would, you know, the, the moral of this story is, oh, like you said, you had your more, more famous one-liners, comebacks. Well, literature gives you one-liners all the time. So-and-so mm -hmm. said this, so-and-so said that. Um, and I think that's, that is helpful in situations like about the loaning of the money. Um, right. Like if, is there a solution that works out well for both people where you don't lose your integrity? Because it Let comes down to a thing about the integrity, like your story so so well illustrates. Right. How do well, you know, me, one reason I always related to work, and I'm sure this is true of all of you. It wasn't let like, me, I'm sorry, uh, let me just finish this. I know I'm talking too much and I'll stop. But one of the important points for me was from a very early age, and this is why I identify with when work says this, when he says, you know, I couldn't do that. I'm not even tempted because it's outside in my realm of possibilities. That's how I felt. It wasn't like I could get all this money if only I didn't write the book like the guy wants me to write it. It was like it was inconceivable to me. I knew that if I accepted the deal, I wouldn't be able to write the book because I'd sit there resentful that I was conforming to his wishes. And I, you know, I'm sure you all had that experience. It wasn't like even a temptation, really. Uh, it was just, I said, I can't, you know, I, I didn't even occur to me as a serious possibility. So, I'm sorry, uh, Mike. I, no, I, but, no, but that's a but that. Uh, like uh, uh, artists take commissions sometimes, and but the same issues come into Rourke's stories of integrity, of how much can you handle, how much can you take, and he tried. Like he tried working for other people, like the guy who who used the modern architect and the classical architect all together. So he tried to 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 function that way uh, and realized it's not going to work. Right. Um, I took my first commission at. 20, uh, 19 years old, to do a portrait of these kids, family portrait. And based on the photograph, there wasn't much information there. And the mother said, but but the, the fourth kid doesn't quite look like how she really looks. And I was thinking, it looks pretty well close estimation from the photograph. But after that, I never took another commission. It was so uncomfortable for me because I was going like, what she sees in her mind and what I see in my mind are not not gelling. I thought you and were then, the people uh, said it would paint a picture of me, my husband or wife, and then they paid you. It's not working by commission. Yes, yeah, and that's just you know. After reading Rourke, it's like, no, 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 don't don't even think about going down that path. It's just going to be miserable. Um. Let me relate a quick short story that in which you might find some relevance to this Rourke situation we're talking about. My first brother-in-law, when he was in college, his best friend was the son of a wealthy contractor from La Jolla. Jim was short of money and he asked Phil if he could borrow some. And Phil wrote out a note, making it a business transaction and Jim was offended. And Phil told him, Jim, you have to understand, this is business, our friendship is separate. And Jim took a couple of days to think about it, and he realized that Phil was right, that that was the way to go about it. Yeah. yeah. 
that's interesting. I have a somewhat different approach to that, but the people differ. But going back to the original, does anyone else want to say, I, I was sort of hogging this scene and I'm sorry, but does anyone else want to tell a personal story or relate to anything that we've covered up to this well, point? I just want to maybe point to an earlier part of the book is um, Rourke is willing to work with pay for, um, uh, oh, forgive me, sorry, I forgot his name, Howard. Um, what, what, what's the name? Uh, the name of the architect that he apprentices himself to. Um, Cameron. Cameron, Henry Cameron, sorry. Um, thank you. Uh, so I think that is clear where he is sort of aligning with what he is willing to do and not do for money. Um, and um, from everyone else's perspective, he's taking this job with this like washed up architect who's kind of low status and who's almost got like a, you know, um, black mark against his name in the architecture community. Um, but he, he's, he could have taken a job with, uh, you know, Peter Keating at the, right. the, the eviction firm for money. And his value is, he's like, no, I want to learn from someone that I really uh, value the work they do. That, you know, it inspires me. And I'll work at a lower rate of pay and a crappy office. And, you know, like the desk will have like three legs on it sort of thing. Because he values that. And I think um, I can identify a bit more with that aspect, having taken one or two jobs so far where it was mainly to learn. They're like, okay, I'll take this job to learn. I right. get paid as much, but I'll pick up some really good skills. I think everyone's probably done that, right? So, well, how I, about we... I, I have a question for Marilyn. In, okay, in writing, it's you've got a limited thing. You've only you've got a thousand pages or five hundred pages or whatever to tell a story. So you're, you're doing the novel, and you got to tell a story. And if a character does something that would be practical but not really fit that well in the story, doesn't that complicate their character? And maybe to a point where the character becomes so complicated that it becomes mush? Right, so- I mean, as opposed to like us in real life, we can say, well, I can work with you in it, or we can write up a contract, or we could do this, or we could do these other things. But um, that might work out perfectly, right. but well, in a condensation of a novel. But that's really one of the pleasures, one of the great things about literature is, yes, you can be entirely consistent in, in literature and a character can, um, can play out, play these things out very logically, can, you know, beat the odds, do everything. Whereas in, um, and it's also, it's, it's, a, it's a finite, as you said, you point out, it's finite space. We can see from beginning to end the whole development of the character. And that's very satisfying. It's very satisfying, says um, psychologically. So, um, so yes, when you so we, the reason we're talking about this is because when work does that, it's like, yeah, you go, you know, do that. Um, and everybody would have felt a little let down. And I think Rand was very good at that. I, if, she, if she didn't invent it, um, that saying, you know, I'm going to keep these characters um, consistent. I'm going to keep them. Um, heroic, they're always going to have, they're going to be um, put upon in, in, in terrible ways, but they're going to be able to, they're going to be able to stand it in ways that I think a lot of us know maybe we wouldn't necessarily, although sometimes we would, but maybe all the time we wouldn't. So yes, that's really one so, of the... So in literature though, when, when something becomes realistic, do some, does it often like just fall flat because yeah, it's like, oh, the character yeah. doesn't evolve or develop in that small space of the novel? Right. Or then you just have a bad writer, a crappy book. <laughs> that happens quite a bit, I think. Black yeah. Rose is enough for them around. <laughs> what Michael said earlier, I mean, before I had to draw off to the door. In a way, I think you made a good point, Michael, that Rand wants to dump everything going wrong that possibly could go wrong on Lord, uh, which is sort of like the trials of Job in a way, you know, sort of like a test. It's not oh. a test, but, 
But uh, then on the other side, you have Keating, <laughs> who who essentially kills this guy at a hire, or causes him to have another stroke. Because he's afraid he won't get the contract for the uh, Cosmo Slotnik building, and he won't make a partner. But not only does he kill the guy, he gets his full inheritance, and he gets the contract. So, oh. <laughs> so it's like all the all of the terrible things fall on work, and all of the wonderful things fall on uh, uh, cheating in terms of external benefits. But, but uh, that's something I want to get to to do. So. She's not easy on her heroes, um, yeah. and she just makes the worst things happen to them all of the time. Absolutely. But that's the point. You can't be a hero if there's nothing happening, right? Right, but could, yeah. could that also be her part of, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit of getting knocked down, failing, but continuing to go after your dream and go after what you want? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Carolyn, I just wanted to add, you mentioned the Frank Floyd Wright exhibition that was in New York. So I, I went to the weekend. Yeah. Um, and thank you for posting it. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known about that. Um, and something that was interesting about it was that I didn't really know much about the personality. And turned out that Frank Floyd Wright was a bit of a um, self promoter. Like uh, he cultivated a big personality and being on television and um, I thought that was very interesting uh, because in reading The Fountainhead, there's kind of this uh, uh, scathing look on maybe work in the personal connections versus mm -hmm. work itself purely standing for something. Um, and clearly with Frank Lloyd Wright, there's kind of both, like a bunch of amazing work and this incredible legacy, uh, but also the personality was like very uh, containing elements of Peter Keating. <laughs> so it was kind of. That's fascinating. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks well, Brian. Wasn't the most uh, likable of people here. What Stop about him. what about Rand's self promotion for her books? Well, she's in an interview, isn't she, with Phil Hughes or something? And, yeah, yeah. She, she did promotion. She and, about that, that she confronts him like point blank. You know, he, you're self-promoting, and she's like, yes, because I'm an excellent writer. I've never been good at promoting myself. I'm pretty good at promoting other people, but I find it kind of awkward to say, hey, I'm great. Uh, you should, you know, finance this book or whatever. And, uh, but that's also a good case of the difference between literature and real life. Like if you were to sum up, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's character in a novel would be maybe quite different if you're using as a it's character. A novel actually about Frank Lloyd Wright. Is he uh, such a genius uh, artist? He was a genius artist, but I read at least in the, this novel he was a, had a very messy personal life. Yes. Um, yeah, and uh, well, plus that stuff with the tour guide. They took us through the, his first house that he lived in with his family, and uh, kind of late Victorian and she'd say okay uh, he had these windows up okay in one room he said when the neighbors built a house that he could see through this window he didn't want to have to look at their house so he had the ceiling the roof raised so he could put the window higher up stuff like that. that's not exactly right but and I'm thinking really I mean it's so offensive to have to look out a window and see your neighbor's home that you're gonna go oh, yes. <laughs> Oh, well. oh, yes. <laughs> um, when you're talking yeah, about you'd rather work, see the sky, you know, the sky. Uh, you're talking about Rand's self promotion or promotion of the books. And <coughs> this whole of Rourke and Keating and and Rand as the author, there's a quote that makes the rounds of the internet. And it's Rand saying a creative man is motivated motivated by the desire to achieve, not by the desire to beat others. And it reminds me that here she's created this character, Rourke, who epitomizes that, Keating, who is the antithesis of that. And this is Rand talking about 
her innermost feelings. Right. And she she has written these books, whether it's Dance Them with the Living Fountainhead or Atlas Shrugged, that is written from her personal viewpoint of life. It's mm -hmm. not an author that's just written a mystery that or whatever just to please the mob to make a little money. This is her putting herself into her literature. There's she's that created these characters that she believes that man should epitomize. So um, she's created his characters to make it ideal. Yeah, I think that all serious but, writers and all serious artists in general, even though I write fiction, this is the way I feel. You, you reflect a lot of yourself and everything you write. I remember I just came up with this expression. I talked to Barbara Brandon in her apartment back in the, when I was working on my first book. And we were talking about that. And I said that I thought of writing as sort of a paper mirror. She goes, oh, George, that's a marvelous face. I call this face from Barbara Brandon. I, I would walk home on a cloud, you know. But yeah, that's actually the way I view it. Uh, you, much of yourself is reflected. Even now, I suppose there's sort of hyper technical. You have them quotable, huh? George, paper mirror. What about it? Do you have it a little bit more fleshed out in a sentence? Yeah, I actually included it in an essay I published. Oh, please post, please post it uh, on the on the on the on the page. Okay. On the Fountainhead page, because that's a beautiful paper mirror is just fantastic. It was one of those things I didn't even think of. I want to quote you. On, I want to quote you on that. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote in called Ayn Rand is philosopher. I think in Atheism, Mind, Render, Other Heresies. And I was. It was one of those. Frankly, it was sort of one of those things. I thought, hey, that's good. You know, good for me. But it just came. It just sort of popped out. And and um, I also had an interesting. And I wish I could remember this because you guys would find it interesting. Uh, the last ten years of her life, Barbara and I talked a lot on the phone. She'd call me up and we'd talk for an hour, sometimes longer. And I sent her an email once and she thought the title. It was called, uh, you show me yours and I'll show you mine. And I said, why don't we exchange the single paragraph we published that we're the most proud of. And I sent her one that I liked. It was oddly enough from the Lysander Spooner Reader. It was a uh, part of that paragraph. But she sent me a paragraph and unfortunately I don't have the email anymore. I forgot what it was, but she said, of all the things I've ever written, and it was from Passion of Ayn Rand. And so, uh, you know, I, I like that sort of thing where writers or artists get together and are honest with one another. I remember I used to run in Long Beach a professional writers meeting thing. We met once every couple of weeks, and only published writers uh, were could join. We wanted people who were serious writers. And I brought up the issue, and I'm kind of like that. Let's all talk about our personal selves and our psychologies. And, the struggles and there are about seven people in the group and Jay Neil Sherman, the science fiction writer. I, I shouldn't have mentioned his name. Sorry, uh, Neil. But <clears throat> shit, I wish I could take that back. Anyway, um, I said, do any of you read your own published material? Occasionally I'll go back and read my first book, you know, after I haven't looked at it for five years. And it's an interesting experience because you lose track of the fact that you're the one that wrote it and that you read it more objectively. And Jay, uh, and uh, this fellow, I won't mention his name, said, no, I never do that. That would be whatever. And later in the meeting, uh, he, had a, he had a briefcase. And uh, he opened it up. He wanted to read something. And the only thing the briefcase contained was his published book. <laughs> and he read a passage. And I remember thinking, OK, so much for the I never read my own material thing. But do, uh, those of you, you've all written some things. You ever go back and I don't know if you've published but I'm sorry, we're getting off the topic here, but I'll finish this up. Do uh, you ever go back and reread for your own stuff and kind of go, or look at your own paintings and yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, you ever, I think self-praise is an important part of life. I think when you do something well, you don't you have to go overboard, but you need to recognize this is good work and you need to kind of say it to yourself explicitly. You, you can't get into that, ah, I don't, don't want to uh, sound immodest, but. Well, in the Fountainhead, doesn't she have work going over his old stuff? Like, you know, he had student work and he had, you know, papers and drawings uh, lying around. And, and when he had no work, when he had no job, he was like rethinking. Right. Like, oh, if I make this little tweak, this could change this. And that. so I, I thought she fleshed that out as a creative, a creative person is that it's not like it's always fixed in stone. Right. Right. You can't go back. Um, 
but okay. sorry, with I, paintings, I recommend that. <laughs> Don't go back. <laughs> you ever, whatever kind of work you're involved in, uh, go back and say, I did a good job there. Yeah, I should be proud of that. Or do you, I mean, I, I don't mean just sort of implicitly, but actually thinking it to yourself. Uh, I've, I've long believed that's an important part of uh, a creative artist or a creative person of any type, having the fuel to keep going, because you're really going to hear from other people. Well, I think, too, doesn't Rand talk about when you're writing creatively is to allow yourself to really let your passion flow and edit it the next day or edit it later. And I think from, from my experience of being an artist is that if I'm if I'm loving what I'm doing, I love it 10 years from now. Right. I, oh, I love this. And 10 years later, I, I feel the exact same that that's important to allow yourself that freedom. And and I like how Rand talks about that in her nonfiction and, and uh, in work's character of going through those pieces. Well, in my case, having published a major book, Atheism and the Case Against God, which is a pretty big topic in my early 20s, if I go back and look at parts of it, it's almost like a different person, because I, I assume that as an artist, you've matured over the years and you're somewhat different now than when you're in your early 20s. Same with a writer, it should be, if you, have, you haven't learned anything in all those years. So in some cases, I'll look at it and think, well, that's interesting. That's not the way I'd write it today. Right. But I try to recapture that sense of how I thought in those days. And I'd say, for an early kid in his early 20s, that ain't, that ain't bad. That, I can live with that. But then there are those occasionally embarrassing passages. I was under pressure of deadlines. I had to write something, and I go, ah, oh, jeez, how could I, how could I have written that? But anyway, and I, I, again, not to get too super psychological, but I view that if you look at early work, you're able to view your life as a whole, the span of your life, that you've improved. In some cases, I think I veered away from the original spirit, that kind of enthusiasm I had in my younger years. And I think it's important to try to recapture that. Does she anyway, have, does Rand have work do that? That uh, moment of introspection? Of, of, of looking at different pieces and still being critical, but saying it was a different time? I remember about that is that he's looking at his development and he's saying, oh, I, I see how now I know better um than i did then so with with uh, i wouldn't have done it that way because i i know better i understand more um but i don't see him as being uh, um sentimental but uh, just by but being very um uh frank and looking at it and saying yes that that was good that's what i knew how to do at that point but now i see um how it how it would really be better adele you said almost nothing uh, I Hope we haven't been pushing you out. Do you have any comments you'd like to make about any of this? No, sorry. It's it's really late for me. I'm trying to okay. stay awake. Well, I appreciate <laughs> the effort. <laughs> I just want to make sure. You're, you're doing a very good job, Adele. Yeah, you look wide awake. <laughs> okay, listen, I want to change stuff a little bit. You know, I've mentioned before in these groups how what a kick I get out of these old details of sometimes minor characters. And there were just some comments in here. I don't know, but I've got so many bookmarks in here. Um, oh, shoot. Just give me, someone talk for a second and give me a chance to find uh, the passages. They're very short little comments. Um, well, I'll just paraphrase them. Um, one of my, I actually didn't know what Rand meant, and I wanted to ask. Okay, here we go. Uh, this is when. Keating's coming on to Dominique, and she says, I don't care, really. You know, you're no different than any other person. And she describes herself as frigid, and obviously makes it clear that at that point she was a virgin. The term frigid, of course, is very politically incorrect today, but at the time it was heard of commonly used. But um, this is, a, I honestly don't quite, there's one or two meanings you can give to this. <clears throat> he, meaning Keating, spent more time with Dominique. Dominique watched him complacently as if he presented no further problem to her. She seemed to find him suitable as an inconsequential companion for an occasional inconsequential evening. He thought that she liked him. He knew that this was not an encouraging sign. Now, I mean, the, the number of jabs she gets at Keating from Dominique's perspective is really quite funny sometimes. But he, what is this 
I mean, he knew that this was not an encouraging sign. This could mean one of two things. The fact that Dominique might actually like him was not an encouraging sign, or the fact that he practically believed that she might like him, he convinced himself, was not an encouraging sign. I have, no, I, I have no doubt that he convinced himself at that moment that she might like him, but at other times when he that was in his moments of introspection, he could say, no, she doesn't, but I want her anyway because of the way other people will look at me. But the not encouraging sign part, was that a reference to the fact that she might actually like him or the fact that he believed that she might actually like him? That's what I don't quite mm -hmm. get here. Right. I I'd think like it, to see that exactly where it was. Yeah, I'd like to look at that language. See, I'm using this larger, I, I realize that the page numbers and the, the uh, pagination isn't the same in this. Uh, and the, some of you have the small New American do you, Library. Do you mind reading that again, okay. George? Um, uh, here we go. He spent more time with Dominique. Dominique watched him complacently as if he presented no further problem to her. She seemed to find him suitable as an inconsequential companion for an occasional inconsequential evening. Uh, he thought that she liked him. She knew he knew that this was not an encouraging sign. So is it him thinking that that's not encouraging or is it the fact she might have really liked him? I, I assume it means the fact he convinced himself of that, that he was uh, living in a fantasy world. Oh, I like that. It, it seems to be kind of mysterious about their, the, 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 their authentic selves where Dominique's being kind of authentic about her kind of nihilistic or her her passive, like whatever, you know, it sounds like it's inconsequential, that's perfect for me. But it's kind of her authentic default mode. If she can't have heroicism or great things, then she goes into this kind of gloomy um, passive state. Right. Where the, you know everything is horrible. It's very kind of subtle. It's kind of mysterious how it's written. Why would Keating think it was a discouraging sign if she really did like him? That's because he's not likable. <laughs> <laughs> I think his authentic self is that I am not a good person. I I'm not likable. Am I, and so if someone I, likes me, something's wrong with them. <laughs> you might have a point there, Michael. It might be that he would think less of her if she really, he really believed that she liked him. He might think, well, I'm such a schlep here. I and mean, anybody could possibly like me. Can't be as good a person as I thought okay. they were. Yeah, or what's the motive? They can't possibly they actually like me. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That was interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah. Notice these little things. <laughs> right, and so yeah. if, he, if he thought that she liked him, he would think less of her. Which would ruin it for him, uh, having her be this, the, this, the, the, the perfect, as my point out, the perfect wife that everybody would um, ad, ad, admire. Ah, and of course, cool. she doesn't like him, so that keeps him interested. Well, that keeps him interested so much <laughs> on so many levels. <laughs> something that would convince me that my original person. My original person. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to get, did anyone else want to say anything about this? Um, okay. Again, I may not be able to find the exact quote. Um, Adele, were you going to say something? What were you going to say? Well, uh, just the, the way I always read it and, and thought about it was that, yeah, she, she likes him, but that is an, an encouraging sign because it's it's such a mild feeling. It it There's there's no passion. There's no sort of like, it's, it's just very flat. It's, oh, yeah, I like you. That's that's all there is to it. I got the feeling that basically, awesome. even when she says, I like you in the same sense I like you as she lists these other guys, and that it's like she's bored and she just wants yeah. to pass the time, someone to keep her, you know, from throwing valuable works of art uh, from several stories up. <laughs> out the window. That's right. At some point, she should toss Keating out the, off the balcony. Okay, this is more significant philosophically. Um, okay, shit. You know, I found this passage just before this started and thought this is important. Okay, here we go. 
this is after he, I don't know, he says, did I murder, um, hire, uh, well, I didn't, but I almost did. I, I didn't want to send him back to the hospital with a stroke. Certainly, I think he would have legal liability. Um, I don't know about that. Anyway, um, he's thinking about this. Keating left the office early that day, not hearing the congratulations. Everyone's congratulated because they inherited the old man's money. Um, he had no dinner that night, but he drank himself into a ferocious lucidity, interesting phrase, at his favorite speakeasy. And in that heightened sense of luminous vision, his head nodding over a glass, but his mind steady, he told himself that he had nothing to regret. He had done what anyone else would have done. Captain had said it. He was selfish. Everybody was selfish. It was not a pretty thing to be selfish, but he was not alone in it. He had merely been luckier than most. Now, I relate to this because in a series of articles I wrote for the L.O.R. website, uh, I, I quoted Ferenza notes from her journals about the characters of Keating and Tui. And she, she specifically said these characters are meant to be selfish in the conventional sense. In other words, and I kind of got me off guard when I read it years ago. I was thinking, that's interesting. She's, she's not saying these are altruists per se, but she's saying the conventional notion of selfishness is all screwed up. And here it comes up here again with Keating saying, yeah, I'm selfish. So he thinks of himself as being selfish. Um, now, this gets kind of into philosophy, but the, my question is, in what sense was Keating selfish in, in kind of using another man's life to further his I mean, throughout this book, he appears to be the ultimate selfish, you know, guy who wants to kick other people out, so make room for himself. So, and is there a sense in which you would call a king selfish? Um, one of the things you have to remember about Rand and selfishness is she saw altruism ultimately as sacrificial. There were those that were sacrificed and those that would sacrifice. Right. And Keating showed himself very capable of sacrificing others to okay. his desires. And in that and sense, he was selfish in the way Rand considered selfishness right. in a conventional sense. Well, Rand said that traditionally selfish versus altruistic, they were conceived in terms of uh, whose interests you wanted to promote, your own or other people's. And, uh, and if you read the introduction or the preface to virtue of selfishness, she said she condemned that as a beneficiary, beneficiary criterion of morality. She said the rationality of morality of an action isn't in, based on who you hope to benefit from it. It's based on a more objective standards. Uh, this gets, I don't mean to get overly complex about the philosophical issues here, but um, because most people would say, Without, if they hadn't read Rand's ethical theory, they would say, well, Peter Keeson's this very selfish guy. Uh, I mean, he's he's tromping over other people to attain his own goals, which, to be fair, is the way a lot of people think about selfish. True, but Rand labeled it conventional selfishness. And in doing so, I think she was talking about the way people generally think of selfishness, right, not right. the way that she chose to characterize it in her philosophy philosophic manner. Look at some 18th century writing uh, in the British Enlightenment especially. You find philosophers praising what they call rational self-interest. Yes. Uh, and then you find them sometimes contrasting that with quote selfishness. And they yes. can see uh, rational self-interest in the same way that Rand did more or less that you take the you take into consideration the rights of other people it doesn't mean you know hurting other people. Whereas they thought of selfishness as more in the sense of I don't care what I have to do to get my calls. I'll, I'll go over anybody. But Rand kind of got her into philosophic trouble because she adapted the word selfishness to mean rational self-interest. I think that was sort of a literary stroke of genius because it caught people's attention. But traditionally, selfishness was often contrasted with rational self-interest. Well, that's that's also, I, I, I'm not really a linguist at all, but one of the problems of of living in one country, like just speaking American, and then when they don't have an actual word for rational self-interest, they don't have like a one concept of it. So you see the debate going on with selfishness versus altruism, where altruism is pretty specific of what it is. I always but, thought it was an impish elfin ran that she knew that the word selfishness would jar people. Right. A bit of a literary, you know. 
but it's not like there's a perfectly coined phrase that defines um, a, a wholesome, honorable way of looking out for yourself and for your values. We don't have like one word for that. Right, I agree, that's a good point. And we've got the concept, but like, what's the one word for it where you have altruism, which pretty much stands for, you know, others before yourself and others. So it's a very complex concept all wrapped up in one little package. So I think, I, I don't know in other languages, like in Russian, or even if they even have that concept. Adele, we, what, what languages do you speak? Or language? Language? I, I speak German now, a little. Oh, a little. Do they have a word for that? For self-interest? Self-interest? Yeah. I'm not entirely sure. I haven't thought about it. Okay. I'll have to look that up. Yeah. Ask my German friends. You know, it's, next thing. it's interesting that Keating in rationalizing what he did uh, uses almost that social metaphysics as well. I'm selfish, but everybody's selfish, so I'm just better at it or luckier. What would you call it? Would you have a single word for what Keating did? Uh, what's his name again? The old man that had the stroke. Um, Higher. Thank you. Uh, yeah, do you, is there a word if somebody said, well, how would you describe that action by Keating? It certainly Man wasn't. Uh -huh. Manslaughter? Oh, yeah, okay. I wasn't thinking so much in legal terms, but personally. I, sometimes that sort of thing used to be called narrow self-interest or... Opportunist? Uh, yeah, that's not a bad word. In a, in a, in a, in a, in a superficial way, an opportunist? And extortion. What's that? He, it was extortion. He had that letter. Remember, he, he was right, right, right. Of course, blackmail. Blackmail. Um. So if somebody said, "Well, wasn't that really in his self-interest? Look what it got him. It got him all this money. Uh, he got the partnership he wanted." So uh, you know, if you argue with a kind of a freshman philosopher guy, he'll say. Well, it was really was in his self-interest. It advanced his career. So how was it not in his self-interest? Because he's going to have to live with it for the rest of his life. And that's true. But that's assuming he had a conscience. Um, I know people, or heard of, or read of people who just do terrible things, and it, it doesn't seem to bother them in the least. It's part of their, you know, almost. But, are, but is their language skewed? Could be. No, so when people get away with things or they rationalize like conventional self-interest and then they, they manipulate situations or they're um, like uh, uh, Madoff, Bernie Madoff. Right. So that, so that they, they rationalize things, but then I wonder how skewed their meanings of words are. So then they use a word like selfish or they use a word like self-interest or ego or all kinds of other words and how how they would define it quite differently than how it might be defined in the dictionary. In fact, if you watch that, I'm Marilyn I haven't talked about this thing before. There was a made for TV movie about Bernie Madoff, I think. I think it's made for a network or something like HBO. HBO. And after he gets cost, hot, he has a standard excuse for well, it wasn't all my fault because my clients were greedy. They want to make a quick buck without earning it. So, you know, sort of a conspiracy between the two of us. Kind of an odd justification, but he says that I think at least twice, doesn't he, Marilyn, in the movie? Mm -hmm. And so that's what, you know, with, with Rand, she was bringing as, as much as she could as authentic concepts that really dealt with our, our evolution or with our inner beings and, and, and creativity, and but very authentic concepts versus the inauthentic ones. And I know from personal experience that people that are off, they tend to distort language. All right. All I right. think also an interesting, I know we're getting short on time. Um, but could we, um, everybody say, you know, their last minute comments? It's, it's um, four minutes after, and I don't want to keep people past, past the hour. So. Okay. 
I, I can clear now. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I'm sorry we didn't have more people. This is a wonderful group. And frankly, personally, this is ideal for me. So I appreciate everyone coming. Okay. All right. Thank Bye, everybody.